you. It's your vote and your voice. This is one of those defining moments in American history. Each of those who vote will be remembered. So let's love good. Let's get back to work. This year, it's America or Trump. And America's counting on you. If I was a gambling person, um, not really, I'd probably bet uh, there's more chance that a flying pig uh, on top of an elephant will be seen uh, crossing the Atlantic uh, than Speaker Johnson still being in the position of Speaker this time next year. Some would say this time next month. What a palaver. Uh, first of all, we have the situation where the Senate has approved the uh, foreign aid bill and now the House will do their best to wreck everything. And then... Uh, Immigration. This is really a situation where, for the Republicans, they feel everything to do with immigration is a vote winner. How they're going about it is a total mess. No other description. Uh, particularly when, if they see a story they feel they can leverage towards pushing their particular point, uh, well... Brianna Taylor, who's on CNN, is an unsung hero. Uh, we'll start the clips with her talking to one of these Trumpy Trumps who just makes a palaver of it. And you ask yourself, where is this all going to end? Because we are meant to be, I would say, in an election cycle. At the moment, it looks like the remnants of a circus. That's how bad it is. It's not even a circus. Uh, Clown Trump is just providing over... Well, he's just... It's just a load of rejects. Seriously. What an ab... Ugh, I've run out of words. I will say this, though. If anybody thinks that uh, Speaker Johnson is probably one of the worst speakers ever, like me, press the like button now. I'm just back It sounds like you're defending... You it de sounds like you are defending those those immigrants who are like illegally that were beating our police officers. No, it's it's saying I am, because we've got no, people excuse who are me, here did I, that do I did not say okay. that. No, it's I absolutely not okay, and they should not be in our country. Ma'am, I absolutely do yeah. not think that is okay. And anyone watching that video, I think, should look yeah. at that and absolutely say that's not okay. So, yep. uh, I think you're really misunderstanding where I'm coming from. No, that's not okay. Let's talk about catch and release. Yeah. Uh, this is obviously huge for Republicans and really for anyone who is concerned about border security. But when you look at catch and release, you have to look at what's causing it. And it's a judicial backlog, right, of people who are coming and they are Hi. applying for, excuse me, I let you speak, who are coming to protect, or coming and looking for protection. Yeah. There's not enough room for everyone. So you have them being released. But the law that you said you don't need, the Senate deal, had it passed and, and become law, would have prevented that. It would have actually, no, actually upped it that have. credible. It would have yeah, upped that no, credible it fear thrush. It would have upped that credible. No, it actually fear. wouldn't have. Yeah. It, me, it was. A, it would have it would, allowed five thousand people in would, our country a no, day. No, that's not true. The, and that's which not is true. Five the border times patrol as much council as was coming through. Ma'am, may I please speak, or I'm Trump going to have to cut this? If you won't let me speak, I'm going to cut the interview off, and I will let you speak and finish sentences. I would okay, be and please, Thank please give me that much. respect as well. Thank you very much. So what I will say is the Border Patrol Council dis disagrees with you. They've been very frustrated with what you are representing as 5,000 people. That is actually a trigger, right? Which is actually, we're above it right now on the border. So yeah. it's not as you represent it. But what you would have is a credible fear threshold that would be increased such that you would actually, and it would also create positions at the border to more quickly process people. So you would, yes, you would have some people granted asylum and more quickly, but you would also have people kicked out of the U.S. in greater numbers and more quickly. Can I respond? Sure. I finished my so it's not to say that they're joining the RNC leadership table to universal acclaim. I just got off the phone with a Republican strategist who compared the idea of Laura Trump uh, being the co-chair to cousin Greg becoming CEO in succession. That it's not something <laughs> that is especially widely received as helpful to the RNC, but it does speak to the fact that these party committees always become tools of the candidate who is running, who is the nominee of that party. Support uh, what he's doing here, and I'm very outspoken that he's made a mistake. He's siding with Schumer and Biden. But after the election, you said, hey, if there's a vote after that, would you vote for bridge when we can? I can say right now he doesn't represent me or, or conservatives in Kentucky or conservatives across the United States. He's doing the bidding of 
Schumer and Biden. We're only here because of just one prick. And he decides that the rest of all of our schedules and our lives and, and holding up this bill to the getting to the House for all of this aid, it's incredibly frustrating. And there's no work being done. It's just bad performance art. And Fetterman, of course, was referring to Rand Paul in that comment. Paul had been one of those handful of Republicans who have been outspoken in their criticism of this bill, although it did not achieve a majority support among Senate Republicans. It did have significant support, given that McConnell supported some of his top deputies voted for this as well, and almost a majority here. Now pressure on the House to take action, even as the Speaker of the House has indicated he has no interest in taking up this plan unless they come up with some other proposal dealing with the border. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't long ago that Republicans across the board supported aid for Ukraine against the Russian invasion. On the House side, lawmakers are speaking about a discharge position to, to effectively get the House to vote on this, working around the Speaker. Without getting into too much detail, I mean, how convoluted a process is that? Or is that one that has legs? It's very complicated. In fact, what it is essentially is it would circumvent the Republican leadership. Remember, the Speaker, the House Majority Leader, they decide what bills can go on the floor. The Speaker has indicated he's not going to put this Senate bill on the floor. So what they can do is they can get 218 signatures. People, Democrats, would need to get some Republicans on board to sign on to a petition, essentially putting this bill on the floor, forcing a vote on the floor. But this rarely succeeds. It takes a lot of time for it to play out. Hakeem Jeffries, a Democratic leader, just told his colleagues he wants to use, quote, every available tool to try to force a vote. But Jeffries himself is expected to lose Democratic support over the fact that the Israel portion of this aid package does not include conditions in providing Israel with that money. So he's going to lose some Democratic support, meaning he has to get even more Republicans to back it to get that majority threshold. And Republicans, of course, facing pressure from Donald Trump, from their leadership, not to sign on to this effort. So a lot of questions about whether this can pass and whether they can actually circumvent circumvent Mike Johnson's opposition. Yeah, we'll look. I mean that. The rest of the world looks to us. The stakes are already high for American security before this bill was passed in the Senate last night. But in recent days, those stakes have risen. And that's because the former president has sent a dangerous and shockingly, frankly, un-American signal to the world. Just a few days ago, Trump gave an invitation to Putin to invade some of our allies, NATO allies. He said if an ally didn't spend enough money on defense, he would encourage Russia to, quote, do whatever the hell they want, end of quote. Can you imagine a former president of the United States saying that? The whole world heard it. And the worst thing is he means it. No other president in our history has ever bowed down to a Russian dictator. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I never will. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. When America gives us word, it means something. When we make a commitment, we keep it. And NATO is a sacred commitment. Our nation stands at an inflection point, an inflection point in history, where the decisions we make now are going to determine the course of our future for decades to come. This is one of those moments. And I say to the House members, House Republicans, you got to decide. Are you going to stand up for freedom? Or are you going to side with terror and tyranny? Are you going to stand with Ukraine? Are you going to stand with Putin? Will we stand with America or with Trump? Republicans and Democrats in the Senate came together to send a message of unity to the world. It's time for the House Republicans to do the same thing, to pass this bill immediately, to stand for decency, stand for democracy, to stand up to a so-called leader hell-bent on weakening American security. And I mean it sincerely. History is watching. History is watching. In moments like this, we have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America. The world is looking to us. And there's nothing beyond our capacity. Speaker Johnson, do you have any plans to bring the supplemental to the floor? Speaker Johnson, would you take up the Senate bill? Speaker Johnson, urging you to. Speaker Johnson, do you want to fund Ukraine? National security begins with border security. We have said that all along. That's, that has been my comment since late October. 
Oh, you worried about the constitutional question that could be said by New York a second to come back to bite you when the tables are turned? I don't know. Thank you. Why not? Mayorkas is an exceptional case in U.S. history. I think he has brought more uh, damage on the country than any cabinet secretary that has ever been. And if it's ever been merited, it is right now. legal minds have said about this report is that it kind of goes, of course, outside of the scope of norms. It, it goes, it, his reporting and who he talked to went outside of what would be normal, even for a special counsel. Do you think that should be investigated or looked into? Because the, the judicial system, the judiciary is kind of in a, 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 not, a, not a positive view necessarily by the American public at this point. Well, in the role that I have, all, all I can do is pointed out, which is you had an investigation that ran for 15 months, which could have been concluded in just a few months. There was never any question that the president had not engaged in criminal wrongdoing. He was the self-reporting party here. He had turned the documents over upon discovery, cooperated in every respect. And yet somehow in this report, uh, the special counsel felt compelled to engage in this irrelevant, unfounded, and often pejorative commentary. And I think it's clear that uh, that commentary is inconsistent with department norms. And let me just make one point. I want to stress it. The special counsel is bound by the norms and policies of the department like any other prosecutor. The special counsel regulations provide that he is bound by those norms and policies. He doesn't have an exemption from them. There's some view that perhaps because he's a special counsel, he didn't have to observe them. And that is simply not correct. By the terms of the rules, he is to comply with those norms and policies, and he didn't. Do you wish the attorney general had done more? Could he have? I'm not going to I'm not going to speak to anybody other than the special counsel and his performance in that particular report. Uh, the president said the other night that he understood why the attorney general and thought, you know, he could not only under, understand, but did not find fault with the attorney general's decision to appoint a special counsel. It was at that point that I got involved. And so I can speak to what the special counsel did for which the special counsel bears the responsibility. Bob Bauer, thank you. I know you taught a long class before you joined us, so I appreciate you making the time for us tonight. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jen.